Okay, so I have 12.30 on my side. Nato, can you please confirm that we can start? Hi, Melandi. Yes, we can start, please. Awesome. Okay, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, setting aside time for me. I do hope that I can add value uh, by the end of the session, just if there's one thing uh, that you can take away with that with from this session, I would be very happy. Um, I have confirmed that everyone can see my screen, so please let me know if you cannot. And um, yeah, this is part of the DRD information sessions. And thank you to Fadwa and Sonazo for inviting us. I love this forum because it's a, a group of individuals, um, everyone from different spheres in our university. So it is uh, quite exciting to hear the questions and the comments that come out of this forum. And on that point, questions, uh, please ask questions throughout the session because I believe that everyone can learn from your questions, even if it is in the middle of my slide. I do have a view of the little hand up, or if you do just want to um, pop it in the chat, I'll have a have a look at it and I'll address it as, as I get a second. So let's jump in. With me talking this much, you probably need to know who is this little face. So I am Melandi van Yerden. I'm the Privacy Learning and Development Officer within the Center for Information Governance. Uh, recently changed our name, not published yet, but I did let my boss know I'm going to officially start calling us this from today. Um, we are a, a very, 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 very small team, uh, population two. And um, I am facilitating this session because what we do in our center is we have to look at the university's approach when it comes to information governance and management, working from an information governance framework. And that includes um, looking after the response to the Poppy Act and the Promotion to Access of Information Act. I am sure that you have all heard our um, are just, we just using the, the short and um, if we just want to quickly combine the two, it's maybe papaya or uh, papayas. I don't know what you want to call it. So, but this is what we do. We try to make it as exciting as any regulation could be. Um, so this is what we do. And I did not go into depth with the other services that we actually offer in our center because I do want to respect the fact that we did sign up for the specific tool that we want to um, share with you today and go through it today. But please, afterwards, if you have a question of what else we can offer and any questions about institutional permission, um, database requests uh, for questionnaires, that's also something we do. But as I said, we can chat about that um, afterwards if we have a little extra time. Okay, so now quickly a disclaimer. Please note that even though this is recorded, that the regulatory environment does change. We have two guidance documents that's still to be published. So anything that I do say today might not be valid in the short term or the long term, um, but we do hope that you can um, still learn something from uh, what I uh, talk about today. And then also, uh, if you have to look at the recording afterwards, um, that it's still valid for you, but please do check with us if um, some of the statement, statements that we made are still valid. So let's jump in. To be able to jump in, we first have to take a step back to understand where this all comes from. Why is this necessary? Let's go back to the basics. The definition slash purpose of uh, the Poppy Act. And this is where the tool that we are going to talk about um, today is coming from. It's coming from the Poppy Act. Um, so I'm going to read this. Please follow on the slide. The purpose of the Protection of Personal Information Act is to protect people from harm by protecting their personal information. That's all we focus on today. It's the personal information. 
It governs when and how organizations collect, use, store, delete, and otherwise handle personal information. So it is not just the moment that you uh, collected all the, the raw data from your questionnaire that you distributed. It is not just the moment that you um, record the interview. It is actually from advertising your questionnaire to the end of the retention policy of five years or 10 years or whatever. It's the entire process that the Poppy Act is, uh, is uh, relevant to. So we have two role players to make this simple and to kind of give you uh, some context of where you might fit into this space is um, we have a little information icon and then we have a little superhero. So the information icon is the, the person that we get the information from. We call them the data subject under the Poppy Act, or while one of the definitions in the Poppy Act is for a data subject, and that is the person that the information is collected from. So I am going to assume that most of us in this forum are researchers or get to do with a lot of research. Um, so uh, this is the participants in your study that actually um, provides you with some information. And then you become the responsible party. I, I call this the super protector because that is under the Poppy Act what we want you to be. You are become the super protector the moment you get a list of email addresses, the moment they submit the questionnaire to you. You become the responsible party. Please also, to make this relevant to your you as an individual, um, Every time you sign up to a newsletter with your email address, you were the data subject for the company that you supplied your email address to, and they become the responsible party. Just a, a very um, simple explanation. Okay. So what is the real risk? I tried to make this not scary. <laughs> um, I don't think it looks that scary. It looks very plain. So the two major things I wanted to highlight today was, firstly, the liability. The Poppy Act puts the liability on the person that processes and uses the information, which is you as the individual and also the organization. So if something does happen with the information, um, you could be held liable or the institution could be held liable, okay? So for the regulator, the information regulator, they the, um, the, the uh, body that controls the Poppy Act um, and the, the buyer. So they um, have made about, geez, uh, roughly about seven uh, statements or can you say uh, reprimanded a few people <laughs> and not too many but it has given us some direction to understand that they are serious about um, the the rules in the regulation they are serious about implementing this the process maybe could be slow but you never know if we're the next one to to um, pop onto their radar. And part of the regulation, it is our responsibility to make sure we have everything, everything, everything in place to make sure that when they do get here, we have a file to give them to say that, listen, yeah, we did everything we can. Because the next issue we have is breaches. And this is not always something that we can just implement a new software for or a new control for. Okay, so breaches, a uh, few examples of what we actually had in the university this year was um, attaching the wrong documents to an email and sharing the email uh, to participants that's not supposed to, to get it, which is defined as a breach under the Poppy Act. It could also be... Um, just by accident sharing information with the wrong person 
or maybe not by accident, not for me to, to tell which which is which. And then we have another one, which is the Teams SharePoint OneDrive integration and configuration. There has been some that's not set to private, some that um, has participants in the team that's not supposed to be there. So if there's one thing you can maybe take away today, go and look at the, the teams that you are an owner of and just make sure it's set to private and everyone that's on there is supposed to be there. Especially if someone maybe left the team or moved and does not have the, the, the same capacity um, to still have access to that. And then the third one is technical, but in this specific example, IT is doing an amazing job to try and cover us as far as possible to avoid the human error. Because unfortunately, a lot of our breaches does come back to human error. And a lot of, um, we are a, a very uh, human focused and driven institution. And a lot of what we do depends on the actual person behind it. And um, for example, something that IT has done recently is the password regulation. I know. <laughs> We're probably not that excited about it, but it is a very, very good regulation to um, get up to speed to make sure that um, we cannot be hacked easily because hackers just get smarter and smarter. The other one is if you do create a new team now, it is automatically set to private, which is great. I want to hands to IT for, for organizing that for us, because that does protect a lot more people. So any new ones that you do create, it's already set to private, which is great. Um, I quickly want to pause here because I know I rushed through a lot and I said a lot and I just want to hear, does anyone have a question? This was just more of a, this the introduction phase to what we are going to talk about next. And just put up your hand or if someone wants to write something in the comments, I'll give you a second. I see we do have a hand. Uh, Dr. A Adams. Hi, I just want to check. Um, when we have student examination papers or test papers where their names and surnames are on and their student number, um, how does one safely then get uh, get rid of it, these documents? <laughs> Can one just put it in uh, uh, recycling? Um, I, I worry about if somebody gets access to information, I'm thinking to what extent can you actually use that student's information for something? But I'm, I'm just curious about what we can do if this is in fact something that could potentially come to a breach, if you were to put papers in recycling. Yes. What okay. other options are there? Okay, so you said we're working with a name, a surname and an SU number. Yes. That's the personal information that we're collecting. And then also, obviously, the answers could be personal opinions or um, something like that. OK, so I'm going to put this question on ice because with the exercise that we'll be doing, we might get some answers through it because um, the personal information that we are collecting has um, certain value to it. And then I'll chat to to do to do um our archives officer she has uh, the retention policy i'm sure it's available as well but then we'll just uh check with her what um they recommend we do with it i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure about this situation specifically so i'll just rather go double check and then come back to you with an answer in terms of um how we dispose of it Is that OK?
Yes, thanks. Okay. Okay, so let's see if we, if we can get an answer by the, the end of this session for you. And then in terms of the, the archiving or retention or um, ex disposing of, um, I'm sure we'll get an answer for you afterwards. Okay. Okay, so um, any other questions? Thank you so much for your question, Dr. Adams. Any other questions that we have so far? I don't see anyone, anyone's hands or anything in the comments. No, okay. So let's go on. Everyone's very smart here. So everything I'm telling them, they probably already know. That's probably why we don't have questions. Okay, so I'm just quickly making that note. Moving forward, now we're jumping into the tool. Uh, I have posted the tool in the chat. I've copied the link as well and the PDF. So whichever one works for you, the link takes you directly um, to our website copy and the, the PDF is the, the exact same one. I made sure to download it this morning to make sure we have the most updated version. Uh, just give me a, a thumbs up if you could download it and have it open next to you to be able to work on it. Okay, I have a thumbs up, two thumbs up. I'm going to assume that's enough for the rest of the group. Please stop me if you do struggle. Okay, the preliminary personal information impact assessment. It's a very, very sexy name. I know everyone wants to take this name. We are just going to refer to it as the PPIIA. <laughs> Or maybe if I feel very brave, I'll just uh, use the full name or just impact assessment going forth. Uh, this is self-explanatory. Preliminary, preliminary means it's before we actually attempt to uh, pursue a process that we are considering personal information. That comes back to the purpose of Papia that we just chatted about. We focus on the personal information. And then impact assessment that assesses the risk of the, the information that we are working with. Okay. So for me, I want to know, but why? Why do I need to do this? Come on, just give me the, the, the real reason. Because I'm not just going to do anything anyone tell me. So this is the why. The... Poppy Act outlines that the responsibility of an information officer, which in our university is uh, Provem, and then we have the deputy information officer, which is uh, my boss, Dr. Uh, Gerald Toy, um, and then we have delegated uh, information, well, not information officers, information curators, which is every individual. Um, and we are, as an institution, as individuals working with the personal information, responsible to include conducting a personal information impact assessment. And this is why. Okay. The reason why Poppy says we should do it, it's to ensure adequate measures and standards exist in order to comply with the conditions of lawful processing of personal information. Okay. So that's the why we are here, why we should be doing this activity. Now, the purpose for this specific tool and what this tool assesses. This one is, it, is, it describes the processing of personal information. Okay, Processing, please keep in mind, it's inherent and residual. It is from the beginning to the end, it's the entire data management process, okay? The second one is the necessity and proportionality. To back this out a little bit, the necessity, I'm going to give you an example. We are doing research, it's an honors project, to evaluate the efficacy of an assessment tool, okay? Now I am collecting addresses of the students complete using this assessment tool. Not necessary to my outcome. Okay? And then the proportionality, now me as an honest student, decide that I would like to have this assessment tool 
applied at all 26 public universities, and then I'll do research at all, six, all 26 public universities. So that's the proportionality of this. That's just one of the examples of what the proportionality could be. Okay, then we it helps you manage the risks. It gives you an idea of what is the value of the information that you are working with and gives you the risk level around that. And then it also helps us as an institution build compliance. Um, as you'll see here at the top, it also refers to the data protection impact assessment. This is the name internationally used for this. And in the European GDPR, which is the PAPIA equivalent, we this is a, a mandatory assessment that they, they published that has to be followed. Uh, Poppy does, did not actually publish something yet. They did not uh, create a tool yet, but Gerald Toy, our deputy information officer, created this tool specifically for our institution, which is to be used internally. Okay, so I'm quickly going to stop here for five minutes because I want you to we're going to do a practical on that document. So I want you to quickly think of the research project that you are working with or an information sharing process and information. Um, what's the other, uh, other verbs that we can do with the information? Any process that you are considering of taking with information, doing with uh, personal information. Um, take that and then please consider these five points and quickly make notes of what your specific collection method would be, what data are you collecting, what's the purpose of each piece of data that you are collecting, and what's your storage and protection measures. Okay, so I'm going to give you five minutes to quickly jot down these, these um, little notes and then I uh, don't have to go into too much detail because the tool also gives you like a lot of options and the question, the answer is always yes or no. So it's very, very easy. Okay, so I'm just going to mute for five minutes.
Okay, so you have two minutes left. For those of you who are done, uh, please take a second and share in the comment um, what is the specific process that you are Are you a researcher? What's the environment that you perhaps are operating in? Or uh, are you, like I said in the example, maybe moving some information to new software? Uh, are you maybe part of the new Sun student system <laughs> where there's a lot of information being moved or collected? Please just maybe we can refer to more relevant examples then. So are you a researcher or a non-researcher and which environment are you in? Marika, are you in bursary's office? Um, no, we're working at Sunset at the education faculty. Uh, we, we are dependent on funding for for future um, courses that that we that we um, give for for the departmental um, institutions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that was my my alarm. <laughs> so the five minutes are done. Like I said, don't have to go into depth. We just want some information to be working with to be able to do this quick assessment. Okay, we have another researcher, uh, please continue sharing the environment that you are operating in. I would like to, uh, if I do use examples, to try and pull it back to what you, what you are working with. Okay, so I'm going to assume that everyone has this information. I know it's very vague to say just collect this because I know as researchers, you probably already started typing an essay for me, um, but no need. <laughs> Let's jump into the tool. So if you do need to find the tool off line or not on this session, um, not offline, offline, but I mean not in this session, there is our website, which is very easy to remember, www.sun.ac.za forward slash privacy. And in Afrikaans, it's privatite. So it's very easy to, to remember. So it's just a forward slash privacy. And then... You scroll down and you'll get a little section that says tools and the first bullet is the interactive pdf and the second one is for printing if you like me and you like a piece of paper between your fingers then that's the one for you okay what's nice about this one we do not collect it there's no data coming to us from this one there's no official submission you can just go in once and then that's it you don't have to have everything ready beforehand to be able to complete this the tool has some guidance within it so what we do is you can complete it and then you're like oh okay my risk level is a little high let me go back and then i can re-evaluate or if i don't have any information i can just go and get the information and then complete the document we with doing institutional permission actually complete this with all our requests that we that we get as a, a second measure of making sure that our evaluation of the information was correct and to guide us in giving advice to the application applicants to make sure that we give them the correct advice for their level of research that they are doing. Now you're going to scroll down past the first page. The first page gives you some definitions of what the, the act is. It gives you an introduction to the document. And then we get to this section. Do I actually need to run this assessment? 
but gives you a lot of options. Things like um, if you're launching a new app, that's even, it's not specifically listed here, but indirectly it is one of the, the, the reasons to have to do this assessment. The first one is for a research purpose, are you processing personal information for research purpose? I think there we can, a lot of us can click, are you this one? I am launching a new product or service. That's like, for example, the app that I just mentioned. I am going international. This is a big one that we work with. This definitely needs this assessment and perhaps a full privacy impact assessment. Um, and then there's a lot of other options that you can pick. So uh, click on the interactive PDF. If you have it open in front of you, just click one of these and then you can move on to the next one. And this one is straightforward. As I said, the answers is very easy. It, it gives you a yes or a no option, and that's it. There's no in between. <laughs> a lot of Poppy Act is, um, it depends, but with this one, it's a yes or a no. So you have to make the, the distinction. Um, is Are you doing research or working with information belonging to children? And under the Poppy Act, that is anyone younger than 18 years old. So very easy, just click yes or no. And then we'll go to the next one. Question two. Okay, everyone done with the first one. And now it, at the second one, which is special personal information. Okay, so per, special personal information is a specific category of information that under the Poppy Act was defined as a higher value group of information. Less them. Anything regarding religious beliefs, uh, philosophical beliefs, race, race, ethnicity, trade union membership, political persuasion, health, sex, life, biometric indicators, allegations of criminal behavior or cr information that relates to criminal proceedings. So give you, to give you an example, biometric indicators, fingerprint, um, this is something that estates with fingerprint uh, access. I have to look at. Uh, sex life could be what do you identify as? A question like that links to sex life, which is special personal information. And then health could be something very obvious, but something not so obvious could be how did the, for example, assessment tool that I've previously referred to make you feel? That relates to mental health mental health comes back to health. So if you are working with anything that could be categorized under any of these, please click yes. If you are not, please click no. And if you are, make sure that it directly relates to the purpose of your research or the process. Is it really necessary? That's also what this tool is supposed to, is doing. It makes you think. Is this really necessary? Because if I click yes, it's immediately going to up my, my level of um, risk that I am working in. And if I click no, I can avoid that. So maybe it is as simple as removing the question. Maybe it is not. Then just make sure you have a good explanation for the purpose of collecting that specific information. Okay. Everyone good with this one? move to the next one. Um, then we have unique identifiers. So this is a second category of information, which is under the Poppy Act deemed as higher of value. Unique identifier, we have made it very easy for you and once again listed a few common unique identifiers which is in the second paragraph, it is bank account numbers, policy numbers, ID numbers, employee number, student number, telephone and cell phone number, email address, because you can only create one email address with that specific name. So that becomes a unique identifier and then any rep type of reference numbers. In some instances, even a person's 
uh, name and surname in a population could become a unique identifier because it's unique to just them. We don't necessarily just uh, throw it in here because we don't see the entire the uh, entire population list of names and surnames, but that's an example of how the context within Puppy Act changes and it, it depends on what's the other information that you also work with. But with unique identifiers, if someone um, has, a, let's say, for example, my employee number, they can get an email address as well. And if you're internal, you can probably start sending me an email. You can see some information on my, my Microsoft account. Um, so that, that's just an example of it depends on what, of what else goes with that information. So when I come back to that exam questionnaires that we completed, we now have a unique identifier on them. And in combination with the name and surname, that's definitely a high value information. So we have now evaluated, evaluated this specific one. We have identified that it falls into one of the higher value categories. So that just gives us something to consider moving forward with that information. Like, um, like uh, the doctor said, that we have to um, we have to understand what could be done with that information afterwards. Okay, uh, to think of an example, something that's been done before is to just take the name and surname and send to other people that might know that person an email to say quickly, quickly send me a voucher from from wherever because I don't have food. Or um, sorry, that's a very sensitive topic. I'm so sorry to have used that example. Um, but that's the that's the type of uh, things that hackers do and people that's malicious do. They they use they work on on your emotions and they use the the specific name and surname, or um, now they include the the person's SU number and send it to one of our our um, admin uh, departments and um, this starts to look legit because now we have a name and a surname and we have this issue number. So this person knows some things about themselves. So maybe they are legit. Maybe they, they really can request a statement of assessment or a statement of their finance. This is something that's a real risk in our environment, in our institution. And it's our responsibility uh, as the information curators or the responsible parties to make sure that we protect that information. So that's why I said I'll just go make 100% sure of we, how we can protect that information until it's 100% disposed. Okay, so now we go to number four. We're almost done. Can you believe it? <laughs> it's really not that, uh, that intense and it's supposed to take maximum 10 minutes um, with me talking the whole time. Obviously not. <laughs> so let's jump into question number four. Um, will it be anonymous? And if you see the question, it says at the point when you plan to collect the personal information. So think through the entire process that you are going through the point of collection. For example, a very good anonymized process that we have in the university is a red cap or sun survey questionnaires where we have a uh, uh, but a researcher requesting, obviously, with ethical clearance and their um, institutional permission, a database. We we uh, we uh, what's the word? Request the database. We cleanse the database, and then we share it with the Sun Survey or the Red Gap team. So it's just the email addresses, and then you, as the researcher, never sees the email addresses. And if your questions does not include any personal information in them, that means it is anonymized, anonymous. So 100% you can click yes here. If there's any process where you are actually emailing the person, that's not anonymous anymore. Um, any focus groups, not anonymous. Um, so I think, yeah, that's two quick examples that I can, can uh, Give you so this is just a yes or no answer again. 
And number five is contextual considerations. This is still a very, we refer to a sticky one in puppy, um, but because puppy is so very new, there's still a lot to, to um, figure out and a lot of guidance that we'll get from uh, working with the regulation. And um, this one is, could be like financial information that could be used to commit fraud. Is that maybe research that you are doing or information that are, you are working with? It could also be an example is uh, doing research um, of people that refers to substance abuse or could be a health research specifically um, mental doing research on violent behaviors. These are some things that could contextually be included into this question. So it's those something different, something not 100% um, falls into the first four um, questions and then could perhaps be here. But like I said, this is a sticky one. Even we have to go through the entire definition again and again to make sure that if this situation actually applies to it or not. So if you think yes, then tick yes. If no, then let's continue. And then we have the little column with the scoring. So take a second and complete your scores on the right hand side. It is uh, just up to a total of 13. So if you did not get the document, the interactive document, quickly calculate it to the total at the bottom. Or if it is the interactive one, it'll help you with the total afterwards. If you're done, please uh, pop in the chat your, your total score that you got. Okay, so either everyone is a little shy or still calculating. <laughs> Anyone that uh, scored a one or a zero? Okay. So let's move forward and then we'll see the, the categories of information. So these are uh, very, very, this, this whole tool is a very high level assessment of uh, the value of the risk that you are working with, the value of the information that you are working with. So the first one is minimal. This means it's most likely anonymous information or while well, it is anonymous information and there's very little or um, no personal information involved in the entire process. Probably low means there could be some little risk, um, but then medium, which is uh, links back to you collecting personal information, identified personal information, special information, or information uh, linking to children. And then high, level, high risk is if you have a combination of multiple of the, the questions where you answered yes. Okay, so we have one person saying they had a six. Um, so this, this puts it in the higher risk category. Uh, this also gives you an idea of 
Floppy doesn't give you a lot of room to move within low risk. Uh, it's they see personal information as high of value, and this is why this this tool also at the moment it's. You ticked more than one a yes when it comes to the identifiers, children, or the special personal information, it becomes a high value. Okay, so why do we say this? Why do we now want to know why is this high risk or what do I do with the high risk? High risk, the first thing is go back, evaluate, make sure that there's a good reason for collecting each little piece of information. It's a way to just make you think and to understand that there, there is more value to what you are working with, and then just go back and evaluate everything that you, are, that you are doing within the process. The second one is how do you protect your information afterwards? Make sure that you protect it well afterwards and throughout the entire process. Do you have controls in place? Do you have perhaps space to anonymize or pseudonymize? Do you have some space to aggregate some information? Do you perhaps have uh, some opportunities to give brackets for answers? For example, when collecting age or when collecting, um, uh, what's the other options that we have? But could you, could you rather request it in a bracket than in specific numbers. So these are all types of controls that we could consider. But with this, it just gives you some direction to move in. And like I said, go implement some new controls, go consider uh, collecting different information or asking your questions a little differently. And then you can always redo this. So now we're never gonna say, no, it's high risk. You're not allowed to do it. That's not that's not how we work. We're just going to advise you on what can you put in place to actually mitigate the risk that you are dealing with. We could also um, recommend that you use the SU software that we offer. This is OneDrive. This is, uh, like I said, SunSurvey, RedCap. These are the tools that we recommend because. Stellenbosch University has an agreement with these softwares. It is um, SharePoint, it is Teams, um, MS Forms is even okay if it's low risk study. And this is all that you probably uh, did familiarize yourself with when you did your, if you did an ethical ethics application or you worked with uh, research before. Okay, so this is a separate consideration of the impact assessment. And this process takes very long. And this is the prior authorization that needs to be requested from the regulator. There's two scenarios where this could be uh, relevant. One is if you are using unique identifiers to link information in different databases in different um, organizations, for example. And then the second one is to mean special personal information or information belonging to children is being transferred internationally. So these two very realistic scenarios does happen, especially when there's international research being done or there's all databases being collated into one big database. And that is the entire tool. So I'm just going to now jump to, uh, please ask you to quickly complete the feedback form. It literally takes a minute. I've timed it and I've, <laughs> I've had some other people time it for me. Um, so if you can quickly complete this and then while you are completing it, um, please feel free to ask me questions. I know this is a, is a very weird, uh, weird, environment to be operating in and I don't want to assume that everyone just understands everything um, that's why we're here to answer questions uh, yes Hela, I see you have a question you can just unmute and uh, 
ask your question or you can yes okay to all of these uh people on um on the session i am hela marie i'm from the theology faculty and i deal with a lot of postgrad students especially pastoral care youth work child ministry etc what is the best way we can advise our uh, researchers uh, obviously they have to use the tool but what's the best way we can assist them besides just giving them the link to this tool any further on the ethical clearance okay um so me specifically specifically our process is separate from the ethical clearance process um but well um our process i can i can maybe just mention what what happens within our process which is like the institutional permission or the gatekeepers process which is um, specifically if someone needs to do research on issues student stuff or institutional information or um Hila, you can tell me to stop there that you do understand, understand our process and then maybe we uh, can hope someone else answers your ethical clearance question. Um, Melandi, yes, it, it is just, um, I found that we might, even in the humanities and social sciences, many students and supervisors doesn't know they have to um, contemplate the effect of the Poppy Act. Uh, they some hear it for the first time in their life. Yes, so, yes, yes. Um, for my side, I'm just making them aware that some come with me, I've got the data, what now? Yeah. yeah. They should have done it. Exactly. What that's too late. Uh, yeah, they cannot use the data then. Yes. So that's the kind of situations uh, we get in. Okay. I can quickly then explain to you the process, and maybe that gives you some some context to uh, what's the type of um, answers that you could give. So um, the institutional permission process is uh, one of the requirements for ethical clearance. If you do click that, you will be collecting information from issue student staff or institutional um, information. So that's the, the one thing where we do stem from. And then our process is entirely separate, separate. So it's a new application process. It's a very, very easy, very short application process. It's also on our website. It's on our service desk. And it also is on the entire university service desk platform. So you can just uh, go to our entire university service desk platform for, for our specific information governance plugin. And then, or a well, uh, button, the information that we do need is uh, the type of questions that I've just asked when I asked you to uh, prepare for the preliminary personal information impact assessment. So we need to know what's the type of data that will be collected? Um, why are you collecting that specific data? How will you be collecting it? What's your methodology? What platform software will you be using? And then how are you protecting that information? Which, where, which software, once again, are you using? Which type of controls are you implementing? Any anonymization, pseudonymization? Did you have a consent form for um, to, to send out to the participants beforehand? Um, so those are the four things that we, we definitely look at. And then we always go, try to go the extra mile to not say, okay, well, you did all of this wrong. We try to give you more resources or I'm not saying everyone's doing it wrong, but we try to advise throughout the process as well to, to give some guidance to the researcher. We'll always say, okay, but the information that you are working with, it is quite high value. We recommend implementing these practices. And I think if perhaps you can just make sure they know what type of um, questions they need to ask and what type of information we would uh, we we need before we can do the application. I think that's already a big, big move um, to to um, to be able to advise them. Does that give you any any help, Hila? 
Yes, thank you, Melandi, because we we tend to see students that either the supervisor doesn't know or they weren't informed about the process. So it will help, um, as you say, for us just to send them to the right people and to sort it out. Yes, yes. Thank okay. you. And, and if you want, please let me know afterwards. I'm more than willing to um, come and have a session with you or with the students or if you ever have a, a forum where everyone um, all the supervisors perhaps are, <laughs> I'm more than willing to to um, come and do something for the group specifically, or I can share an email with just an explanation or something as well. Okay, thank you so much for that. Thank you for your question. Any other questions or uh, just comments? Uh, you'll also see at the end of the feedback form, I'm asking like what what extra questions came out of this session. Uh, I cannot share everything that Bobby has to offer or push everything down your throat um, that you need to know. Um, that's why we do it in tidbits, in little bite sizes. But this is uh, uh, one of the, the big bite sizes for, for you to be able to use as you walk out of this session. Any questions or comments? I think then that is it. Nozo, over to you. Thank you very much, Melandi, for the session. Thank if you, you are done, then we can. I am done. Okay, thank you. Then that is all for today. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much.